Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for this morning's debate on the question, does the United States need China to fight climate change? The Biden administration has rightly made fighting climate change a top priority, but that has raised a strategic question. Does the United States need China's cooperation to succeed? And if it does, then will that cooperation come at the expense of leverage that the United States government needs to maintain in order to press a China, a China on other critical matters, especially its rampant and unfair innovation mercantilism? My name is Craig Allen, and I am president of the uh, U.S.-China Business Council, and I'm pleased uh, to be your moderator today. So today we will have 10 minutes of opening remarks from Michael Clare and Rob At Atkinson, whom I'll introduce in a minute. That will be followed by five minutes of rebuttal from each side. That will be followed by a moderated discussion between Rob and Michael. Uh, and uh, towards the end of the hour, we will get uh, to your Q&A and we will close uh, by 11 o'clock. So please allow me uh, to introduce our discussants. Uh, Michael is a senior visiting fellow and PAWSS Professor Emeritus, Arms Control Association and Hampshire Co College. He is currently the secretary for the Arms Control Association board and a senior fellow working on emerging technologies such as lethal autonomous weapons and unmanned aerial vehicles. He is a regular contributor to The Nation magazine and a well-published author. And I highly commend his article on the subject that we will soon be discussing. I think probably most people uh, on this program know Rob, but by way of an equal introduction, uh, Rob is the founder and the president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, which is recognized as the world's top think tank for science and technology policy. Rob has also uh, written widely, and I, for one, have learned much from him. While I might not agree with everything uh, that he says, he always uh, makes me think. So the question before us is uh, quite timely, given that Secretary Kerry uh, and his counterpart, uh, Xie Zhenghua, have recently completed three days of meetings in Shanghai uh, in preparation for a climate summit uh, that the White House will host uh, later uh, this week. Now, at least from the joint statement uh, and from Chinese announcements, the meetings held in Shanghai were very successful. Um, the joint statement issued uh, by the two special envoys assured everyone that the two governments are, quote, committed to cooperating with each other and with other countries to tackle the climate crisis. Now, apparently, uh, yesterday, there was also a meeting between Xi Jinping and Angela Merkel over the Climate Order Adjustment Act. And apparently, that didn't go so well. Uh, but uh, at least I don't know much about that yet. Perhaps we will be able to discuss that uh, later on. So this debate uh, between two leading experts is uh, very timely and no doubt will be exciting and illuminating. So for our audience today, please refer to the Slido panel under the video or the event uh, page of the Slido link in the YouTube description to ask questions and, and uh, questions and, and, and answers before our debate poll. Uh, we will have a, a debate poll now. I, I hope, uh, uh, grateful Sydney, if you could bring that up. Uh, and we will replicate this poll at the conclusion of our program. Uh, so we will be able to see uh, how many, if any, minds were changed over the course of the one hour program. 
So, uh, Sydney, if you will, uh, please open the poll. I see it uh, available here to me. Um, let's all take that poll, uh, give it a, a, a second here, and I will report results, and then we'll get going. Uh, just one second, please. Oh my goodness, 100% say yes. Uh, we have uh, the no's have come in. Uh, the no's are, 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 are gaining. <laughs> but it does look like uh, approximately uh, that, that there are far more people who are confident that the US and China can cooperate uh, on climate change and other issues than the other way around. So uh, with that, uh, why don't we begin our discussion? Uh, so let's begin our program with Michael presenting his arguments, and then we'll look forward to Rob presenting his arguments, and then five minutes uh, to both of you in that same order uh, before we begin a moderated discussion. So Michael, uh, if I may, I shall turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and um, I, I want to thank the the, tech, the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation for giving me this opportunity to present my views. Um, th this is an absolutely critical topic on which uh, the future of civilization rests, I believe. So it's very important that we have this discussion. Uh, I'm not entirely familiar with a debate format, so I'm going to do my very best um, to, to present an argument. And I hope that we have a very good discussion. I'm sure everybody will benefit from the contrasting views. Uh, so I'm very um, pleased that you chose this title for the debate. Does the United States need China to fight climate change? Now, the answer to that question depends on whether you mean fight for the sake of it, you know, fight the good fight, fight a virtual fight, even though you know you're going to lose in the end. Or do you mean fight to win? By which I mean fight to stop, stop climate change before it stops us, before it wipes out human civilization entirely and reduces uh, what remains of uh, humanity to a uh, utterly uh, devastated, impoverished remnants uh, scratching out a living on a dying planet. So you have to decide what you mean by fight and what the outcome means. That's what this debate hinges on in my mind. If you're content to fight the good fight, do what you can within practical limits while conceding defeat in the long run, then sure, we could do without China. We could make progress in reducing our carbon emissions, increasing our reliance on renewable sources of energy, improving our agricultural practices, uh, and the other kinds of initiatives that President Biden has suggested, and we could turn to our close allies and ask them to do the same. And gradually we can slow uh, here and there, slow the process of global warming. And as a result of our efforts, our uh, unilateral efforts, uh, we may see a slight slowing in the progress of global warming. Uh, bear in mind that the United States is responsible for 18% of global emissions. That's a pretty big chunk. Global uh, warming emissions from carbon dioxide, 18%. So if we really work hard, fight the good fight, and do all that we can, and that's a big if, but if we make the effort, maybe we could stave off the arrival of the 1.5 degree centigrade threshold 
by a year or two. Now, I want to highlight for a minute the importance of the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold, why that's so important. According to the scientists who worked on the uh, most recent climate studies by, for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, once we go beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade increase in global temperatures above the pre-industrial level, we're going to begin to see irreversible changes to the global climate uh, that will have severe consequences for human society. We'll see sea levels rising uh, uh, several meters, uh, perhaps uh, by the end of this century, or certainly in the next century. We'll see profound droughts around the world destroying agriculture for millions, hundreds of millions of people, severe storms increasing, and so on. Of course, we can uh, talk about this. So 1.5 degrees is a crucial threshold, according to scientists. We're moving very close to that threshold and are likely to reach it in another decade or so on the path we're on, unless we change substantially our behavior. Once we get past that level, uh, our ability to turn things around uh, becomes very limited. So we have to, we have to work now um, and, and work uh, at an extremely intense level uh, to prevent that from happening. And if you don't care whether we achieve that goal of keeping warming from going beyond 1.5 degrees, if you don't care if we lose the fight, then you could say we could stop the debate here and, and I'll concede we could do without China. I'm not one of those people. I want to fight to win. I want to fight. Uh, I want to fight to win the struggle to keep climate change from destroying human civilization. Now, by way of a personal note, uh, I want to say that my thinking about this uh, has gone through a little bit of a change in the past few weeks, uh, and uh, for a happy reason. On April 1st, I became a grandfather for the first time. My precious granddaughter, Fiona Isabel Clare, was born on April 1st. And so my time frame has extended by another 70, 80, 90 years into the early 2100s. I want my granddaughter to survive well into that period and to live on a planet that's habitable, that is not that has sufficient food and water for everyone to survive. And a planet where you can go outdoors without uh, dropping dead from temperatures that are beyond human capacity to survive. So I feel I have a new stake in the outcome of this fight. So yes, I want to see a fight to win. And winning means keeping global temperatures from exceeding 1.5 degrees centigrade over pre-industrial temperatures. And let's get real, uh, my uh, friends. We can't do that alone. We just can't. We have to involve China. We have to involve China for at least five reasons. Let's begin with the most important. China is the world's number one emitter of carbon dioxide, responsible for uh, an estimated 29% of global carbon dioxide emissions. That's a huge, huge part of what's driving uh, the, the race towards higher temperatures around the world. Now, bear in mind that the United States is no longer, while it's no longer the leading emitter in current time, historically, the United States was the leading emitter of carbon dioxide over uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So we bear 
equal responsibility for what's happening. But in current time, China is the leading emitter of carbon dioxide. And if we can't get China to reduce its emissions substantially, we've lost the fight. We've lost. So we have a stake. Our survival, my granddaughter's survival, your uh, children's and grandchildren's survival rests on China's reducing its carbon dioxide emissions. So we have to work with China somehow to get them to change their behavior. And we can't do that, I believe, by going to war with them and destroying China and creating a thermonuclear, uh, you know, uh, global warming, a uh, winter that'll destroy civilization. That won't achieve the, the result. So if it's not, if we're not going to achieve that through war, or sanctions isn't going to achieve that either, we have to cooperate. Secondly, China is continuing to uh, help uh, sustain the fossil fuel economy around the world uh, through providing uh, subsidies or loans to other countries in the developing world that are building coal plants and the like. And we have to work with China to stop that right now. Uh, China's not alone in this, by the way. So are countries in the European Union. So is the United States contributing to the uh, spread of fossil fuel uh, plants, power plants around the world. This has to stop now if we have any intention of winning the fight against climate change. It has to stop now. But China's a leading actor in that and we have to cooperate with China and other countries to uh, stop that right now. Third, uh, China is a major and innovator in clean energy solutions. They are a leading producer of uh, wind turbines, of, of uh, solar panels, they are our leading innovator in electric car technology and in battery storage. So, uh, and they're moving very rapidly to uh, have their entire economy move in that direction while they're continuing to rely on coal, needless to say. But China is also a leading innovator in this area and we need to benefit from China's innovations in this field and to draw on its technology in, uh, in moving ourselves in wherever possible to, to rely on their technology. If we engage in a technology war with China, as the uh, previous administration was doing with respect to 5G and other areas of technology, if we view the climate fight as a uh, zero-sum game, if China wins, we lose, which is the way President Biden described it, that this is an innovation fight, we have to win, we can't let China win this, then we're also going to lose the fight on climate change. This has to be a win-win struggle to, to benefit from advances wherever they are in climate change technology. Fourth, we need China's help in speeding the transition, the green technology transition in the developing world. The developing world does not possess the uh, capacity to undertake the kind of vast changes that are necessary uh, to, to uh, both develop, both expand their economies and do so using green technology. Uh, for financial reasons, they're going to want to move as fast as they can in development, and that often means fossil fuels. And that's what's happening in places like South Africa and in other developing parts of the world. They say to us, to the developed world, yes, we, we agree with you about climate change, but we need your help if we're going to uh, 
both prosper, reach your level of development, and, and do so swiftly. Uh, we can't afford it without your help. So we need China's help uh, big time in financing and speeding the green energy technology transition in the developing world. And finally, fifth, we need, let's call it great power solidarity in fighting climate change, not great power competition and conflict, which is where we're headed today. On the road to, we're on today, um, we're not, we're, we're fighting each other, not climate change. We see this uh, in stepped up military competition and friction. We see it in the South China Sea where the US and China are increasing their military exercises and deployments on a daily basis. We see it in the area around Taiwan where China uh, is pressuring Taiwan and the US is responding by increasing its military presence there. We see it in the waters of the East China Sea. We see it in the nuclear arena where both countries are increasing their spending on nuclear weapons. We see it in US diplomacy aimed at creating a quad, a anti-Chinese coalition of Japan, Australia, and India, which is very threatening to China. Um, and you can see equivalent Chinese behaviors. All of this is like a, a re renewal of the Cold War uh, of the anti-Soviet days. If we persist down this path, uh, the consequences for the fight against climate change are, will be catastrophic. You can't have a successful struggle against climate change and uh, persist in a Cold War with China, which could go to a hot war. So. Michael. Clue. Thank, thank you very much. Would you like to sum up and then? Uh, yes, we're, we're, I, 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 I was at that point just then. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh, I was about to say, we have to choose our fight. We uh, fight to win against climate change requires doing it together with China, despite the differences that we have, which are strong. Um, well, I'll stop there. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much. Very compelling argument. Um, Rob, um, uh, Michael uh, went over a little bit. I will be equally generous with you. Um, would be grateful for your thoughts uh, on this subject. You're muted. Wonderful. Thank you, Craig, uh, and, and thank you, Michael. I really appreciate you joining us uh, for this debate or discussion. You know, a couple of things. I, I don't, <clears throat> certainly the debate is not about whether climate change is real and, and, and a, you know, urgent emergency. You know, we believe that, there's no question about that. That's not the debate. Uh, well, certainly that's not the debate we're having. Uh, I want to win the clean energy <clears throat> revolution globally and uh, ITIF's clean energy project uh, clean Energy Innovation Project is working in that space. But I also want to win another fight, uh, which is frankly equally important to the U.S., and that's to maintain global innovation and technology leadership over China. It's certainly true that the conventional wisdom now is that we should cooperate with China. Uh, recently, five foreign policy experts, including Stapleton Roy and Susan Thornton, uh, who'd been in the State Department, wrote an open letter saying China's engagement uh, is, in crit is critical if we want to address climate change. Uh, Todd Stern, the former climate czar under Obama, said that uh, uh, climate will have to be a featured topic when he meets with, when Biden meets with Xi. And clearly this is Michael's point as well. So this is the conventional wisdom now. And let me suggest it's based on two faulty ideas or premises. The first is really that we need to use our political capital to pressure China to act. That if we don't pressure them, they're not going to do this. Why do we have to do this? Why don't they pressure us? As Michael said, we're, we're emitting almost as much as they are. Why don't they, why aren't they pressing us? Why are we the ones that have to say, we want to save the world, but China doesn't? Not only that, but China has a much, much bigger stake in addressing climate change. Climate change is not going to be good for anybody, but it's going to be a lot worse for them. Uh, they, they have a lot more 
a higher population density, people living in low-lying coastal areas, they have a lower standard of living, they won't be able to spend the amount of money needed on mitigation and, 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 and recovering from disasters. They're much, much more vulnerable to this than we are. They should be asking us to act, not the other way around. But all right, so let's just say they won't and they should and whatever. And we have to, we have to be the grown-ups here. We have to be the adults taking care of the world. Even if you assume that's true, what Michael said is we have to get them to change their behavior. And this is Michael's point about the rest of the world. You know, good luck with that. Uh, there's no way that China and other countries are going to fundamentally gotta get off of fossil fuels unless it makes economic sense for them to do that. And neither are we. I mean, let's be honest, we are not going to do that. Less than 1% of the U.S. population pays a premium to get clean energy, uh, wind or solar uh, from their uh, electricity, less than 1%. So the only way to solve climate change, we just have to be real, realistic about that. It's not to browbeat people into doing it. It's not to provide subsidies. It's not even regulations because countries and citizens and the political economy won't accept that. They won't accept the higher prices. Even we won't accept the higher prices. So the only way to do that, the only way to fix that is to make uh, clean energy cheaper than dirty energy. In other words, the only way to fix it is innovation. Uh, China can give all the financing help in the world to the developing world, and it won't matter. First of all, they're not going to do that. China doesn't give subsidies for the sake of subsidies. Those are all tied to making them making money. They're not in the business of subsidizing anybody and they're not going to be. The only way to have other countries, including China, as I said, adopt clean technology at the magnitude we need is for innovation to make this technology, clean technology better and cheaper. We need better batteries. We need grid storage. We need better biofuels. We need better nuclear. We need clean industrial fuels. We need better solar power. And innovation is the way to ha get that. Now. Michael's argument is, uh, he, what he stated is that, well, he, he admits to some extent that innovation is needed and we're going to need China on climate uh, technology, clean tech. And he says climate is a leader in clean technology. No, actually, they're not a leader. Um, and ITIF has done significant amount of work on that. What they're a leader in is stealing foreign clean technologies, pressuring companies to, pre to transfer it when they don't want to do it, and massively subsidizing less innovative clean technology companies in China. When you look at, for example, the rate of patenting in wind energy, uh, countries like Denmark and even the US and, and some of the other European countries are patenting at 10 times the rate of Chinese firms on a per dollar revenue basis. We see the same thing in solar. Uh, China massively destroyed, I shouldn't say destroyed, well, they destroyed the US solar panel industry and they certainly massively reduced it all around the world because they put in all of these subsidies for solar panels. Now, a lot of climate people say, oh, isn't this great? They, they put in subsidies for solar panels and they brought the price down. That's only good if you think that the current, the, the current polycrystalline solar panel technology is good enough to fight climate change. It's good enough to end up being lower cost. And it is simply not. We still need innovation in solar panels. Now, the problem is, again, Chinese solar firms simply are not very innovative when you look at things like R&D and patenting. European firms, Japanese firms, Korean firms, American firms are. So what we need is an innovation system that doesn't destroy uh, innovation leaders, but enables them. And Chinese policies do the former, do the latter, they, they destroy them. Uh, we've seen this before. Chinese firms, ultimately, they shut out foreign clean energy firms. Uh, companies like Cineval, which was a, excuse me, Cineval was a, is a Chinese state-owned wind turbine company. They stole the technology from American Superconductor, uh, which was an amazingly innovative company built out of MIT. They just stole it. Uh, their battery and EV policies, again, are for, based on forced technology transfer and discriminatory tax policies. The other reason why, why we are in a fight with China over the clean energy industry, because if we're not in that fight, if we say, well, we'll just buy all this stuff from China because they're such a good country and they innovate all this. If we do that, then the political capital, the political will in America to pass the kind of infrastructure package that President Biden has proposed, which incorporates an enormous array of very important clean energy technology and incentives and R&D funding, 
We're doing that not because we want to solve climate change alone. We're doing that because we also think we want to build up our own industries and have thriving economy. If we just simply say, oh, China is going to do all that, we'll buy from China. The political will to make those investments domestically will shrink. We already saw that, frankly, after the Obama investments and the congressional investments after 2009, where we focused on a demand side policies. We just will subsidize people buying these technologies. China focused on a supply side technology uh, policies. They wanted to build them. They won. We lost. We can't afford to make that mistake again. More importantly, though, look, I'd be happy to say, sure, let's cooperate with China if it didn't come at a price. China exacts a price for everything. They're not naive. They're not global uh, well-wishers, if you will. We are. They're not. So engaging China with climate hat in hand will do nothing, as I said, to address climate change. But what it will do, it'll reduce critical U.S. leverage needed to pressure China to dismantle or weaken its predatory innovation mercantilist regime. You know, even Michael admits that. He says uh, in, in an article he wrote, which I encourage you to read, I believe it was in The Nation, he says, if Joe Biden genuinely believes that climate change is an existential threat, it's crucial that he stopped the slide towards a new Cold War. Now, first of all, let's be clear. China started the Cold War. End of story. We did not. China started this. They started the aggression on economic aggression. We did not. What Biden and Trump are both doing is saying, wait a minute, China's not playing by the rules. We need to confront them on that. What is the big risk here? And I frankly don't even see it as a risk. I see it as, as a definite reality is our policymakers and our negotiators are going to have to give up something. They're going to say with hat in hand to China, please, please help us with climate. Xi Jinping is not stupid. He's not naive. He's going to say, yeah, sure, we'll help you with China, with climate, but you have to do these other things. You have to stop with the export control regime that you have. You have to stop criticizing us for intellectual property theft. Uh, we simply can't afford to make that mistake again. You know, there's a wide array of areas where uh, President Biden will need to press China on, on uh, human rights, but most importantly, on their innovation mercantilist practices, which unchecked, unstopped, will not only continue to reduce global innovation, but they're going to hollow out U.S. technology industries and, frankly, European technology industries and Japanese Europeans just haven't quite got to that level of uh, acceptance or understanding as I think a lot of policymakers in the U.S. have. And if we trade off those demands to China to say, please help us on climate, uh, that's just simply going to weaken our hand. Now, again, I'm not saying Biden, excuse me, that, that, uh, that uh, climate czar John Kerry should not have a conversation. Sure, why not? But what I believe is that that conversation will come with a price. And I would not, first of all, I don't think we need to pay that price, as I said before. And secondly, paying that price, excuse me, would be definitely not in U.S. national interest. And it certainly wouldn't make any difference in terms of the climate. Uh, again, in terms of climate change overall, we don't need to press China to do this. It would be nice if they did. It would be nice if we cooperate, but that's going to come at a price. So thank you. Terrific. Well, we have uh, heard two very eloquent <clears throat> contrasting views. Uh, so the next stage of our debate, Michael, I would welcome you to rebut uh, Rob for five to seven minutes, and then we'll give Rob uh, the chance to respond to that. And then we have a, a number of great questions lined up. Um, so Michael, can may I turn it back over to you? Uh Certainly. I wish I had a, a little bit of time to process in my brain uh, what Rob has said, which I, I found very compelling and, and, um, and, and very, very clear and consistent. Um, you, you know, it's, it's not that I would necessarily disagree with the things he says. I, I just think that they're an order of magnitude smaller than the issues that I, I'm looking at. Um, so that's where, where the difference of opinion lies. Um, it's, uh, I would certainly agree with him that China uh, historically has 
uh, gained a lot of its technological uh, capacity through theft of Western technology uh, and forcing companies to divulge that work there to divulge their technology and so on. Uh, that's how every rising country uh, reaches uh, higher levels of capacity. That's how the United States became the great industrial power it is by stealing technology from the UK uh, back, back in the day. Uh, but then it's at a certain point, it, it became more adept um, and self-sufficient in innovation uh, to the point where we're now a leader. And China, I would argue, not, not that I could uh, say with that I'm a super expert at this, but China is beginning to achieve some degree of uh, self-sufficiency in technological innovation and in this area. And I, th I think there's evidence for that. Uh, so uh, I think as time goes on, um, it will become more and more an equal of, of the United States in its innovative capacity. This um, I think is something that would require greater research and, uh, and, and debate, uh, but I don't think uh, one could say that China is simply a copier of Western technology. I don't think that's accurate. Um, so, but I'll put that aside from now. I, I want to come back to a point that Rob made about, I think, a very accurate point about China's greater vulnerability to climate change than the United States. I think there's a lot of truth in that. I, in fact, I think the U.S. China, uh, the U.S. and China are most alike of all the countries in the world in their vulnerability to climate change. That is because we're large continental nations with many different uh, in, environmental uh, ecological regions, uh, but especially because we have large coastlines, large low-lying coastlines uh, that are highly vulnerable to extreme storm activity. We're going to face that on our uh, Atlantic and Gulf coasts with increasing severity, just as China is its Pacific coast as very low-lying areas. Both countries also have areas uh, that are drying out, becoming um, uh, more, more severely su subject to drought and fires. So, and I could go on, but th there's a lot of similarity. And this tells me that as time goes on, the need for both countries to devote themselves to domestic climate uh, emergency action is going to increase. I've just written a book, just published, I recommend it, called All Hell Breaking Loose, the Pentagon's Perspective on Climate Change, which views climate change as a national security matter. And I think for that China, uh, which shows how US military leaders view climate change as posing an ever-increasing threat to the national security of the United States of America. And this was incorporated into a presidential executive statement issued by President Biden in early days uh, in office that climate change is a national security threat to the United States. It is likewise to China in many similar ways. And it seems to me that as we move into the future, the national security of both countries is going to be more threatened by climate change than by anything else. And it's on this basis, I think, that there is a basis for cooperation in addressing these serious threats. And, and it will then force us to overcome some of the differences that we now have over uh, te technological um, barriers, and uh, over some of the other issues between us. When climate change becomes a national security threat greater than um, any other, you know, we're gonna look aside at, at things that now seem to be more important. Uh, so I do think, um, in contrast to what Rob said, that there is a very firm uh, national interest basis in both countries to cooperate on this issue for our own mutual survival. 
So I'll stop there. Michael, I thought that that was a, a really provocative, very interesting point uh, that, um, that both China and climate change are enormous national security threats. And uh, we're going to have to manage both of them uh, well. Uh, wonderful point. Um, Rob, may I turn it over to you uh, for uh, your rebuttal? Sure. No, thank you. And thank you, Michael. So I always laugh when I hear the this analogy. The U.S. stole the technology from the U.K., so it's okay for what China did. Um, sure, the U.S. did. I worked for the governor of Rhode Island. We named our technology program that was designed to bring universities and companies closer together, the Samuel Slater Technology Fund, because Samuel Slater uh, took the plans in his head from, for, at, at risk of capital punishment uh, on, for textile mills. Um, but the big difference is um, I don't believe the U.S. government had joined the WTO in 1776. I, I could be wrong. Um, I don't think we did. And uh, China did join the WTO. And as part of that joining, they signed the TRIPS agreement, the Trade Related uh, uh, Intellectual Property uh, System re regime, which said you cannot steal intellectual property. They signed the WTO, which said you cannot force technology transfer as a condition of market access. So it doesn't really make any difference what the U.S. did. It ma matters what China is doing and the fact that they signed up for all the benefits the WTO gave them, which the biggest one was uh, to, a lot, to prevent the U.S. from taking unilateral action against them. The second point Michael said was well, every country does this. No. Nope. Every country does not do this. Korea did not do this. Korea had an industrial policy, but Korea almost never stole our technology. The same thing with Taiwan. When Taiwan built up their chip industry, uh, which they have a fantastic chip industry now with TSMC and other companies, they actually licensed that. They paid money to U.S. companies, uh, RCA, uh, excuse me, Westinghouse being one of them. Uh, they paid money for licensing. China, much less. Uh, with regard to China being our equal in innovation, uh, there's no question China's getting better. Uh, but if I had to put a bet, if I had to say, okay, I can, I got all my chips and I can only put them in one place and I want to put them on who's going to develop the technologies that are going to save the planet, I'm going to definitely put them on the U.S. There's no question about that. We are so far ahead in many, many areas where we're not ahead. Uh, is frankly uh, doing as much now as we should be in terms of spending money on research, development, demonstration, and deployment. If we were to do that, which is the Biden plan and others in the Congress would have us do, then to me, there's no question that we will lead the clean energy revolution in the world much more than China would. And the last point I'll just make, M Michael was talking about that, that China is a bigger threat to the U.S. national security uh, sorry, that, that, that climate is a bigger threat than China uh, and that national security will be challenged more by climate than anything else. I, I think that's a misleading definition of national security. Uh, if you want to say what is, a, what is a challenge to our country in terms of economic costs or social disruption, you can make a good argument that climate would rank pretty high, if not number one. That's not national security. National security is not that somehow the rainstorms are attacking us or the sun is attacking us. It's national security, someone else is attacking us. And on that measure, climate is not a national security threat. It's a global threat. It's a global challenge in terms of it'll raise costs. It'll do all these other harmful things. It might have, it'll probably, it'll affect crops, ocean flooding, coastal flooding, sure. But that's not a national security threat. And what's been striking to me about this conversation is we haven't mentioned the fact that the single biggest national security threat to the U.S., it's not Russia, it's China. China has made it quite clear. China wants to be the global hegemon. They want to dominate the world by 2049. Uh, as Michael Pillsbury wrote in his book, The 100-Year Marathon, that's what China wants. They want to be us in 2049. They want to be the global hegemon. I would much rather have the U.S., a country that is based on democracy, human rights, um, and all sorts of other protections, critical protections, to be the global hegemon. We use our power, and we've always used our power. 
on average, on net, we've used our power to support global freedom. That's not what China is going to do. China is going to create a world where you have to kowtow to China. Now, I'm not saying they're going to invade anybody. I have no idea what their military ambitions are. But I think it's pretty clear that their global ambitions are to be the hegemon. And if we don't challenge them on their innovation mercantilist practices and build up our own advanced technology economy, including in energy, uh, we're going to fall behind. And, and, you know, Michael, you said you have a grandchild. And first of all, congratulations. That's a, a wonderful thing. Um, I don't. I have, a, I, have a, I have two kids, though, and I hope they're going to have grandchildren. And I'm going to be deeply committed to their future. But I want a future for them where the climate is not catastrophic, where the climate is you know, not causing these problems, and also where the US is the global hegemon. Uh, gentlemen, you've both done a magnificent job at presenting uh, contrasting, but both very realistic and uh, pragmatic uh, views, uh, both uh, long-term and short-term. We have a lot of fantastic questions and I thought uh, maybe I could start off the conversation um, with one of them. Uh, Rob, you had made the comment that uh, innovation is, uh, uh, quote unquote, the only way to fix uh, the, the uh, climate change problem. Um, I, one of our questions, uh, one of our, uh, our audience uh, notes that regulation also plays a very important role here. Um, uh, do you think uh, that carbon taxes and tariffs could and would uh, be enacted uh, to measure carbon footprints uh, and uh, to create uh, a solution here? So the role of regulation as opposed to innovation uh, is important. And let me throw in there that uh, uh, maybe Paris uh, is a good way to build that uh, common regulatory environment. Gentlemen, over to you. Let's give Michael uh, an opportunity uh, to comment. That particular question? Oh, or to respond uh, to Rob, as you would please. Oh, I... Uh, <laughs> Did you want me to respond to that first, Craig, or Michael? Yeah, why don't you let Rob respond first? And okay, thank you. So, Craig, I think that's an interesting, but not quite accurate framing. Uh, it's not a question between innovation and regulation. And the debate is between innovation and deployment of existing technologies. That's the debate. Regulation is an important tool for innovation. So uh, as, as are carbon taxes. Carbon taxes would definitely spur more clean energy innovation. So would investing more in our universities and, and, and programs like ARPA-E. So we need regulation, we need carbon taxes, we need uh, investment in R&D, all designed to get better technologies, not simply to deploy the current technologies we have. Although it'd be fair, even deploying current technologies, if it leads to innovation is important. My only point is if we have only the technologies we have now, they're not good enough to solve climate change because nobody will adopt them 100%. Oh, uh, would you uh, like me to comment, Craig? Please, Michael. Yeah, uh, I would say that that uh, as important as those points is diplomacy and cooperation, if not more important. I say this because if you look at the uh, projections of the International Energy Agency, uh, for example, on future carbon emissions around the world, you will see that the developed world, the US and the EU, will account for an ever diminishing share of global emissions, that the further out you go, the greater the share, uh, I mean, and it's, it's ballooning, of the, develop, of the developing world, including China, if, if you include that in, in that category as, as they do. Uh, if you include India, the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, um, in that category, outside of the US and the EU, will, in, will account for the overwhelming share of carbon emissions uh, at the further we go into the future. And uh, it's fine if, if the U.S. and the EU move in an increasingly uh, proficient direction in terms of what we do uh, in technology and innovation, but if the rest of the world doesn't move in that path, we still lose the game. So it's essential that we uh, take 
efforts, diplomatic and other, to work with the developing world to make sure that they proceed on the same path. And that's going to require financing a green energy fund and other measures proposed by the United Nations and, um, and, and, and other uh, venues to ensure that as we progress, the same thing is happening elsewhere in the world. So diplomacy and cooperation is equally essential to the innovation that uh, Rob is speaking about. Rob? Yeah, I, I just say, with all due respect, Michael, I don't, I don't really agree here. Um, I don't think, <clears throat> I mean, you look at France recently where uh, uh, they were trying to put in place a little bit of a carbon tax on gasoline and they had, you know, France is a rich country and you think that they, they like, you know, fighting climate change and they couldn't get it through. The single best thing the U.S. could do as a gift to the rest of the world would be to develop better technologies that these countries are desperate to adopt because it saves them money. Right now, we don't have those technologies. If you want to go down renewable energy to transform your economy, there are certain niches you can go in renewable energy where it's cheaper, but you can't transform your entire economy because they cost more than fossil fuels. That's what we should be focusing on, helping develop the next generation of cheap, clean energy technologies, and then those other countries are going to want to adopt it because it makes economic sense. So it, it, it's a very interesting conundrum uh, that we're facing here because trade and technology are not inter, they're very much interdependent. Uh, we need to be able to, to buy and to sell globally uh, the latest innovations. So we have a question here that uh, as the trade guy here, I find fascinating. Um, how will the newfound reluctance to source from China due to political attention, uh, attentions affect renewable supply chains and thus the fight against climate change. And you could also add on to that export controls, making the China um, reluctant or unable to purchase from the United States. Uh, is this something that uh, concerns uh, both of you? Sure. Rob, do you wanna see? Yeah, well, thank you, Michael. I mean, Craig, I. I I think those are both very important concerns. I think on the first one on trade, I, I think we should immediately adopt uh, essentially uh, an ITA for uh, for environmental goods and services, clean energy. In other words, the information technology. We should be zero tariffing those around the world. I don't. It's to me it's just terrible that we're still tariffing these products. Uh, we should be free trading them. Secondly. Um, I don't worry too much about some of the rare earth minerals and things like that, the source things, because what that is doing is it's forcing us in Australia and Canada, other countries, to build up our own supplies. And I think that's just good for the world. We'll have more supplies of rare earths that are critical in, in renewables. I think on the last port on ex export controls, I think we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot to not have export controls for Chinese firms that are in the clean energy space. This is where I, maybe Michael and I agree on this. It, to the extent they can do more and do better uh, and, and, and we would be limiting them with export controls, that would be terrible in my view. Uh, export controls hurt ourselves mostly and we do it because we wanna think, we wanna help national security. Clean energy is not related to national security in that sense, if they develop solar panels, not really gonna help their military all that much. So yeah, we should definitely not do export controls in this space, I would argue. Michael, your comments? I don't have anything to add to that. I, I agree with that. Okay. Yeah. You know, I we put um, uh, we put tariffs on Chinese solar panels uh, some ten years ago, and uh, I'm just wondering what was uh, the effect of that on on climate. Let me raise another issue here from our our audience, and I, again, another fascinating question for which there's no easy answer. On Rob's point. Uh, what role does China play in the clean energy R&D ecosystems in terms of scale up and manufacturing and which uh, countries are better positioned? I think that that's a, a lovely uh, question. Uh, and I'd frankly be grateful for both of your thoughts. Hmm, that That is a very interesting question because that's a form of technology that's that's different from the the front end of of uh, what Rob has been talking a lot about is the initial innovation uh, where, you know, I, I, 
basically agree with him in, in a lot of ways. Uh, the, the U.S. is by far and, and other and European countries in a lot of the front end of innovation. But China has proven to be very successful in scaling up these technologies and getting them out into the marketplace and into use. And that's an equally valuable form of technological contribution. And uh, we're going to need to uh, share the, their, their abilities to do that in the future. I'm thinking especially about electric cars, because electric cars are going to have to be one of the key, not only electric cars, uh, electric trucks, electric buses, uh, all forms of transportation. If we're going to succeed in uh, overcoming the climate threat, where we're, we're climate crisis, we're going to have to move pretty fast to eliminate oil-driven vehicles down. And, and uh, China is proving to be pretty successful. It's looking that way. Uh, in getting those out on the road in large numbers. And they're, they're especially uh, making progress in developing batteries. And the U.S. has not yet uh, succeeded, so far as I could tell, in getting mass, mass producing the batteries we need. I, I know Tesla is trying to do that and trying to catch up, but we're, we're behind China in this. So, um, I think cooperation with China in this area is something where where we could really benefit. And this is one of the points that John Kerry raised in his meetings with his Chinese counterpart in Shanghai this week, that this is an area where, where cooperation would be useful. Rob, your views? Well, look, the reality is, is in many of these areas with China, it's, it's, it's not black and white. And so the issue here is, yes, there's no question that China, through its vast deployment policies, you know, subsidizing uh, solar panels, et cetera, um, having special license plates. If you have an EV, it's, you can get your license plate and, and you can drive here, which drives everybody to get EVs. That is super important. And no question, as Michael said, that deployment is an important policy for driving innovation. What I think um, Secretary uh, Kerry should be focused on, though, is to say to China, hey, it's great you're doing these policies, but you need to be national, national neutral. You need to basically allow foreign companies to sell in your markets. If you're going to scale up EVs and your discriminatory EV policies and let foreign companies sell there, same thing with solar panels, same thing with wind, that's what they haven't done. And that to me is, is a real problem. If they were just simply scaling up and, and letting the best product win, great, that's, that's a wonderful thing and they're helping with climate. But the fact that they're not doing that uh, gives me pause. Terrific, what a wonderful debate. Let's finish up uh, here with one final question. And I apologize to everyone uh, uh, whose questions I have not been able to get to, but um, I'd be very interested uh, in the great power competition between the United States and China, which country is more likely to take a global leadership uh, in the fight against climate change? Uh, so um, say 10 years from now or 20 years from now, uh, who do you think will be uh, uh, remembered as the leader in this fight? Michael? <laughs> Well, who will be president in 10 and 20 years <laughs> matters because we know that uh, that, that, that depends on our leadership. We had a president who thought climate change was a hoax and did everything to sabotage progress on climate change. Uh, now we have a president who thinks differently. And if we have a president like that over the 10 or 20 years, I think the U.S. could be a world leader. Uh, the current Chinese leadership says uh, that China is going to be a leader in this field, uh, but uh, at the same time wants to accelerate development in China and, and is allowing coal to continue to be uh, an important component of that development. So, um, I, you know, China can't exactly claim to have leadership in the area. So it, leadership matters in this area, and so we have to see 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, you know, but my true feeling is that 
20 years from now, the way things are going, the impacts of climate change are going to be much more severe and conspicuous than they are today. They get, it's going to be much more on people's minds than now. I, you know, if you look where we are today compared to five years ago, with the impacts we've seen just in five years, the fires in the West Coast, the extreme storms in the Atlantic, the flooding in the Midwest, um, and multiply that because, because it'll increase exponentially. In 20 years, climate change is, I believe, will be the first order of priority for any government. And so I, 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 I think that there will be a, an intense competition among the countries of the world to, to have leadership in this area. Uh, so we'll well, that's fantastic. What a nuanced and, and, and wise perspective. Rob, why don't we give you the last uh, uh, comment on this leadership issue? And in the meantime, Sydney, if you could put up uh, the poll again, let's see if uh, minds were changed. Uh, but Rob, uh, on um, the leadership issue, um, who do you think is in a stronger position of leadership now? And who do you think will be in a, a stronger position of leadership Again, let's say 20 years. Well, I think it depends upon how people interpret and define leadership. Unfortunately, right now, you can get leadership if you sign some document or you make some horatory claims. Oh, you've become a leader. What really matters not is have you made some commitment to zero carbon neutrality or reduction? It doesn't matter. You know, talk is cheap. What matters are actions. And in that sense, I would argue the U.S. is the innovation leader. My colleague Colin Cunliffe at ITF wrote a report recently on commitments that nations made five years ago on, on I think, project innovation. But it's a, how much are you willing? They, they committed, including many European countries, they committed to doubling their R&D on clean energy. We did better than they did. They were all talk and very little action. I mean, some of these countries that say that climate is the most important thing, and they barely budge their clean energy R&D. What, what are they doing? What they're doing is they're, they're speaking politically, which is easy, but they're not willing to put their budget behind that, which is a lot harder. So in that sense, I think if the, if the definition is in 20 years, who has done the most to address climate change in the world? I believe the answer will be the US because I believe we'll do the most to advance innovation, particularly if we can pass some of the proposals or many of the proposals that President Biden has come out with uh, when it comes to clean energy. We can do that and we can get continued support. And, you know, when there's a next Republican president or Republican Congress, if they could at least stay with that, I can understand that some of their concerns about heavy handed regulation or overreach of the Green New Deal. But certainly there should be a consensus on our research development and demonstration in this space. So I'm, 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 I'm betting on the US. What a wonderful debate on such a complex subject uh, that we all need a better understanding on where we all require better governance and better international collaboration. Um, I, um, and, and reflecting the quality of this debate on both sides, uh, we have a very uh, close vote between yes and no. 55% uh, at uh, yes, uh, uh, China and the US uh, can cooperate on climate change without weakening negotiations on other issues and 45% no. And uh, so Rob, you, you gained a vote or two there. Uh, so uh, good on you for that. But uh, Michael, good on you, uh, you won the debate. Uh, so with that, uh, let me thank you both. Uh, let me thank the audience and uh, let me thank uh, Sydney uh, and all of her colleagues at ITIF for a wonderful program and for helping us all uh, to better understand these very difficult issues. And again, to all those whose questions I was not able to get around to, uh, I apologize and uh, I look forward uh, to further discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.